Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, for those of you who are at the intro panel, just starting off with the black possibilities, right? It's stuck in your head. Possibilities, possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> just let it marinate for a moment and think about the incredible minds that are in this room, the incredible minds that have come before us, and what we can actually do in our future. So I first want to just um, recognize the Ujima team and thank you all for putting this incredible event together. As a very proud Ujima member, I am so excited to hold some space um, with both Derek and Mark, who um, are going to help me talk a little bit about impact investing. So hopefully you all are in the right room. <laughs> During our prep conversation, um, for those of you who know Nia, Nia always has some off-the-cuff questions for you, so you just mm. got to be ready. And um, when I was preparing for the session, I kept going through our notes, and there was really kind of three themes that came about. And I want to just share those themes with you so you have a sense of what we're going to be talking about today. So the first one was how to make resources work for us, right? We know that we are in a system that was not designed or created for us, but how do we leverage what's out there to make it work for us? The second one, which was very relevant to the conversation this morning, is community versus individual. And then the third one is what's up next, thinking about our future. So to get us started, I'm going to have us each introduce ourselves. And before we talk about what we do, I want to talk about who we are and what brings us to this work and talk a little bit about our journeys. Um, and I love the quest, I love the, uh, the moral uh, compass part of your conversation this morning. So I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a little bit about a person who has been your moral compass in this work. We know that you're, if you're in this work, it's not easy, right? This work is not easy. And a lot of us bring so much of our spirits, our creativity, our um, well beyond our skill sets to it. So we really want to get a sense of who we are before we talk about what it is that you all do. So I'll kick us off, and then I'll go to Mark and then Derek. Um, I'm Carlene Porcena. Good to meet you all. I am a Bostonian. I've lived in Roxbury, if there's any. Boston people in the house. I've lived in Roxbury for over 20 years. Um, I grew up with a family that was extremely, extremely close-knit. My grandmother was the founder of the first Haitian church of Boston. Mm. So that was definitely a major, major part of my upbringing. Um, I'm a middle child, so a lot of the way I function is around being a, a peacemaker. Um, <laughs> And I have seven nieces and four nephews. So a lot of what is my moral compass is around what are we leaving in our legacy um, in this kind of relay race of, of life that we're in? What are we passing on to the next generation so that they can sprint? Um, when my grandmother passed, I'm going to just tell a quick story because Mark was like, oh, I'm going to tell a story. So I want to tell a story too. <laughs> um, my grandmother, who has always been you know, this icon in our family, uh, at her funeral five years ago, actually five years ago yesterday was when she passed, um, there was over 500 people at my grandmother's funeral. And I learned more about my grandmother and that funeral than I had ever known about her in my whole life. And people kept on coming up to me and saying all these random stories. Oh, she used to... I used to go to Northeastern and she would come and like give me $100 so I could buy books. And she was just this kind of quiet soldier. You know what I mean? She was a very quiet, small woman, kind of kept to herself. Um, but it reminds me that you don't always have to hold the mic to be a leader, right? Mm -hmm. You don't always have to have the loudest voice to really create impact. Um, so when I think about who my moral compass is, I think about my grandmother who brought my entire family here from Haiti to the US um, on her own. So that's my moral compass. I'm gonna kick it to you, Mark. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Watson. Uh, I have lived in Boston almost 15 years before I had to go back to Chicago, which is where I'm from, to take care of my parents, who were my, both of them were, my mom 
unfortunately has passed about a year and a half ago. But um, I wanted to break people out of this finance. Jessica, you talked about finance is a tool. It's not, you, you can't be finance. It's a tool. So I share that because when I was 12, I'm 60. I can't oh, believe God. either. <laughs> <laughs> I cut off of my hair because it doesn't attach anymore. But, <laughs> but when I was 12, I had to take an interest test. And I was supposed to be a social worker or, or a preacher. Mm. And I was very fortunate. Uh, I had two parents who were on the cusp, I have a younger sister, who were on the cusp of the benefits, at least of black folks, of affirmative action. My mother was a secretary, and my father drove the trains in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my mother, who called all the shots, mm -hmm. said, it's time to go get a teacher's degree. That's what we did, right? Professional. We, so my mother became an English teacher, and my father became a history teacher. Tons of books on black history in, in our base. We lived in a little two-bedroom, four, four people, 800 square feet in Chicago on the south side. Uh, meanwhile, while that was going on, I'm just giving you stories so you can, this will connect to other things we talk about. You know, there were no black baby dolls. My father got together with his friends and they, all of a sudden our basement was full of black baby dolls for the whole neighborhood. My mother would type the town crier, you know. We all had our dashikis and our... So there was a very interesting time to be African-American in Chicago and then to have two parents who were going through sort of what was happening in the country. So they marched in the civil rights uh, marches. They became teachers. Then my mother decided they needed to, to get a job at a bank. She read this thing about MBAs in the paper. My mother taught herself calculus. She said, Dad, you, we're going to get MBA. So she got into University of Chicago, and he got a degree in, at Roosevelt in economics. We were supposed to move to Africa. My mother and father, in the 70s, when many of us were not going, up and down the whole West Coast, from Nigeria all the way down, two weeks, my mother decided that we were not moving to Africa. Uh, just because there wasn't a place for women. Smart, black, African-American women in that context was not a role in the 70s. So we came back to Chicago. Fast forward, I'm a kid. I'm hearing all these stories at the table about two people who did get jobs at banks. My mom managed the interest rate swap desk for Bank of America, it was a compliance manager. This is a woman who was a secretary my father ended up being a corporate banker at Harris Bank, 37 years. Who has a job that long these days? <laughs> so I say all that because I decided I didn't want to be a banker. I didn't want to have nothing to do with finance. I heard all the stories, the pain and agony, and cut me off mm -hmm. of what it's like to be black in finance mm -hmm. around the dinner table. I was not doing this. I go to U of I in Champaign. I want a summer job. The only place that would hire me was a bank for the summer. All right. <laughs> I take the job. It ends up being on the trading floor of one of the top largest banks in the country. I had no interest, but I was there and I needed to pay my student loans. The reason why I'm telling you this story is what a treat it was. It's the reason why I'm sitting here today. To learn how finance works, at least the other side. When I was 19, 20 years old, figuring out how the bank raises money and all that, I was sitting next to the trading floor. And I had some black, there was a black senior director who was running the trading floor. This was our first wave of black professionals. We were the kids of like my parents. So there was black folks. We thought we were taking over the world. We were all going to Northwestern. Or, I mean, it, it was a, and in Chicago, where there are a lot of black investment firms, Barack Obama, I knew Michelle. And all, I thought this was the way the world was going to be. Until, fast forward to 40. 40 years old. I'm going to wrap this up. 
40 years old, I end up working on Wall Street, and I see from the other side of how easy it is for money to flow. And I actually became more enraged. This is the 90s, when people find $10,000 bottles of wine. And I just was so angered, and I thought, I'm going to devote the rest of my life to redirecting capital to people I know. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. So that is a long-winded story. My parents <laughs> were my anchors. Uh, my father and I did father son trips to Africa all through our lives together. We met Nelson Mandela together, went to Zimbabwe, all these places. Those will always be my moral code. My father's Alzheimer's now, and I show him pictures. He doesn't remember that we did all these things, but they live through me. So that's... Mm-hmm. Thank you for that story. I also have um, roots in Chicago, Chatham, South Holland, Inglewood. Um, in Chicago, yeah. Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> My name is Derek Peebles. Um, I was supposed to uh, talk with you all this morning, but my plane actually just got here about 45 minutes ago. Um, so I missed the um, beautiful keynote this morning, and I apologize for that. I heard it was good. Um, I'm currently the Senior Director of Inclusive Economy at the American Sustainable Business Network. We're a national organization, and we're a membership-based organization that supports small businesses all over the country. And I got into this work. um, I came out of college and went into banking. Um, And it was my fifth year in the field or or, or so. I was getting promoted. I became a commercial banker. And um, around 2008 is when the economy started to tank. And it was at a time where they were laying off bankers left and right. And it was also during a time where I was having kind of a spiritual, I was, I was on a spiritual journey because I grew up in a very faith-based family. Uh, I also grew up in a family full of males. I'm the youngest of eight kids. Um, my mom passed away when I was about 12 or 13. And by that time, all of my older siblings were out of the house except for one brother. And so I grew up, um, my mom, when she passed away, she was a financial advisor for Prudential. And when she passed away, uh, the life insurance, I was the only kid that was still under 18, so most of the life insurance my mom had went to me. And my dad, not thinking clearly, didn't have any rules (laughs) over over what I was doing. And so I spent the last couple of years of high school just kind of um, on my own. Um, But I was set because of the things that my mom did. And my family grew up in the projects. And when I hear my parents talk about their childhood and what it was like for them growing up, it was stories full of abundance because they didn't have much as far as money, but they had their neighbors, they had their community. They weren't afraid of their kids going outside or being outside because they knew that there were people in the neighborhood that were gonna watch after them or discipline them if needed be. So I grew up in this family of, of Christian values and my father is my moral compass. Um, He's the one that worked in the community. He was a railroad man before he became an educator. And seeing him maneuver in predominantly white communities taught me a lot. And I remember when I was growing up, he told me, he was like, Derek, you're my eighth and final child. He was like, you're turning 18, you're about to go to college. I was a big time football player, went to school on scholarship. And he was talking to me about money, which are conversations we had all the time. And he told me, he was like, Derek, I see how you are. Um, And I see how your older siblings treat you because they're like, Derek, you didn't have to deal with nothing. It was like, by the time you were growing up, 
mom and dad were already set. You didn't have to deal with the things we had to deal with coming from nothing. So my parents were economically mobilizing themselves as I was growing up. Um, and I'm about to go to college and my dad tells me, he's like, Derek, and I'm going to an all white school to play football. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, if you all can't tell in my voice, that's where I was born and raised. Um, my dad's from Chicago, so that side of the family is in Chicago. But he told me, he was like, I wish when me and your mom had started making money, I wish we would have stayed in the neighborhood that I had brought up your five older siblings in. And what he was talking to me about was, I understood 10 years later, was the circulation of dollars. He was like, when I left my community, my dollars left my community as well. And I took you all to the other side of town chasing an American dream that wasn't really designed for me. I don't know what he was going through at this time. I mean, but I think he was scared because I was like his final kid that was leaving the house. But he was telling me, he was like, I see you following your mom's footsteps. I know you want to go into finance. But don't forget about the community values that we taught you. Don't forget about the community service that I took you to on Saturdays before your football games. Those things were important. I would take you down to our church, which was in the projects where my dad grew up. And he would tell me, he was like, back during the 60s, even before that, the black church was the biggest asset financially, spiritually, emotionally, that most black people had in their neighborhood. It was the biggest asset that the community had. And when you look at, I'm an Episcopalian, and talking about impact investing, when you look at Episcopals, for instance, the Episcopals became wealthy off the donations of slave owners. And when you look at the wealth that the Episcopalians have now, it would rank like number 67 out of 170 countries that measure GDP. And I see all of these churches in our communities closing. And I think about all of the land that is going to leave vacant. And one other thing my dad told me was like, Derek, you know, black people are never going to generate wealth until we start to take back control of land. And so when I got into this community work, I had that in mind. And I went through life at that point by trying to look at each individual as an individual with gifts that they can give to society. Every one of us have something that we can give that could be invested in. And when you look at the messages that we receive on a daily basis, every message that we receive daily tells us that whatever we have is not good enough. And I think we need to switch that narrative. And we start thinking of ourselves as people that are gifted, people that can spend their dollars in their own community. I think the more we become conscious of where we spend our dollars, the more that we'll become used to what impact investing is. Because when George Floyd got murdered and we started hearing stories about Black Wall Street in this neighborhood in Tulsa, where there were you know, black doctors, black lawyers, and the flow of the dollars circulated in that neighborhood of Greenwood, Tulsa, 80 times before it left that neighborhood. Now, it was a time during segregation where black people only had to do pe business with each other. But the flow of the dollars circulated 80 times before it left that community. The NAACP did a study 10 years ago. The data is probably outdated. But it said that 
the flow of the dollar circulates in a Jewish community for about 30 days, the longest, in white communities for about 17 or 18 days, Asian communities a little bit longer, about 23, 24 days. In a black community, the flow of the dollar leaves our neighborhood in 15 minutes, less than an hour. And this was data that was pulled 10 years ago. I wonder where it's at now. And so when we think about what this American dream is, it wasn't designed for us. But what I think is that we can create our own dream by starting to invest in each other. That is a perfect segue. I'm going to keep the mic with you. Um, because my first question is actually about the resources that are out there, not designed for us. What are some strategies? What are some you know, ways that you've seen people have the ability to flip it and leverage it for our own, for our own good use? So I'll, I'll answer that with a story, a short story. And so when I came out of banking, I went into um, community development. I was working at an arts institution that was based around hip hop culture, which means you had beatboxing classes, you had rap, you had, you know, um, you had graffiti art. Um, these were the different classes that we taught. Well, these kids that were in our graffiti art class were kids that we were getting from Hamilton County in Cincinnati, Ohio, who had been in trouble for vandalizing highways with aerosol paint. It's what I used to do when I was young. And our program was kind of like a diversion program. So what we did, I was their art instructor. What we did is instead of going out and putting your art on places where you're not supposed to, Let's pull our dollars. As an organization, we'll go buy you all the equipment, all the paint, all the canvases that you need, and we're going we're gonna to do an art show for you. But we was practicing a certain methodology called appreciative inquiry, where we invite people into a place to communicate with people that they normally wouldn't be in relationship with. So we were bringing in doctors, we were bringing in lawyers, we were bringing in C-suite executives to this little art show that we had planned. And I had this one kid who had did a big canvas about the size of that whiteboard over there. And he had it drawn up in graffiti and um, he had it posted on the wall just like that. Well, this doctor, uh, one of our bigger donors came over and was like, my 12-year-old son loves this type of stuff. He was like, what would you sell me this painting for? And this kid, he was unfiltered. He was like, I don't know. He was like, what do you want to give me for it? He was like, I'll give you $5,000 for this painting. And to see the look on that kid's face, like his whole, his whole aura changed. He was like, you're going to give me five, that you think this is worth $5,000? And he was like, sold. It was the biggest painting that was sold the whole night. That changed this kid's life to the point to where he went back to school, he graduated, he got into Columbia Art School in Chicago, and now he's about 26 years old and he runs his own art studio doing the same thing that I was doing, teaching graffiti art students. And just think, if someone would have invested $50 into this kid, because that's how much it costs for his paint, and that's how much it costs for his canvas, made a $5,000 return. I don't know what percentage of return that is, but it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I mean by taking people that we often look at as deficient having different conversations with them that are based on their gifts and their assets, not about where they're deficient. And you begin to have different conversations with these type of people. And what happens is you begin to uncover and identify gifts that they have that they can use to economic, economically mobilize themselves. And that's just one case. So I didn't tell you what I'm doing now, but it's an example of flipping this script. So um, 
I co-founded it together with Condon Mason, who you met earlier, uh, a charitable loan fund called Potluck of Capital. And Ujima and Boston Impact Initiative are all iterations of that. But this is the latest, you know, new and improved, right? And it's improved in a, in a way that is culturally relevant. One of the things that is novel um, is to separate power from the money. So normally in this country, if you have the, the money, then you get to call the decisions. You get to tell the, the grantee what you want reported on. You get to restrict those dollars. But you need some mechanism to actually allow the community to have a say or the benefactors of the capital to have a say in what it looks like, how much does it cost, when does it come back, how, do, how does it recirculate, mm -hmm. what does it invest in. And in our general society, those worlds never connect. Think back to the continent. Think back to the Middle East. Think about, quote, developing countries. When people go in and make an investment, I had a friend, she lived, like, lived all over the world, but um, th she and her husband built a, a town in the middle of Af Afghanistan during the war. And I was at a social venture network conference, and she came in, it was mostly white people in the audience, and she talked about the hospital and the school and the daycare and the apartments because they were building this community to build this cell company in the middle of this war. And she came off the stage after this you know, ovation. And I said, Shaynur, I said, isn't this crazy? Like, you did what needed to be done. You didn't think about impact investing. It wasn't in a little box. It was community invest. This mm -hmm. is what you need. It wasn't compartmentalized and dissected for, you know, IPOs here and venture here. And you did what you needed to have people have livelihood. And I am suggesting to all of us, particularly those of African descent, we need to go home. Yes. And I, well, by saying that, I mean, we need, if you're building investment <coughs> funds or making investments, give capital to support the outcomes. Mm -hmm not to support your extractive returns. That's right. It is backwards in this country. So I Potlicker Capital, for those of you who are not from the South or don't have a reference point, is the juice at the bottom of the pot when you make collard greens. <laughs> and it is the perfect metaphor for all the ingredients that sustain you. It was what our ancestors did. That's what the flavor is. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And use it to season other foods. You use it for maladies. What a metaphor that is. You can use potluck for everything. I got people who freeze it in, the, in Oakland and people in the South, et cetera. But I, what, I'm raising this as a, as a metaphor for you in, quote, impact investing, to think about making contributions uh, for what is needed. So that's point one is, is, is investing holistically in an outcome not in transactional pieces. This, and it's two, separate the power from the money. Intermediaries are one way to do that. I told you that long story about me working at a bank. What I realized is there's people who buy commercial paper and bonds at a bank. You, you know, they don't tell the bankers how to, how to loan that money out. Mm -hmm. They're not telling you whether to do a line of credit here or there. They just buy that paper, put it in their little portfolio, and hope it comes back. That bank has a lot of power. They decide where that money, they decide the red line or not. They decide the length of the loans, et cetera. So we need our own intermediaries. This is not going to change by wrapping people on the knuckles with CRA policies. Mm -hmm. That is a mitigation strategy. That is not a proactive strategy. Right. Proactive strategy is you sitting on a board with the community that is going to receive the benefits, and you all raise the money, and you be the bank. And I don't mean a traditional bank. Traditional banks are stuck. I'm, I'm not dogging totally banks. I just want you to understand the context. A bank is an arm of the federal government. It is, has oversight by the um, 
Treasury, and the FDIC. That prescribes credit boxes. Think about a credit box. Credit box is you know, what we got to look at to make the loan. All the things that our community has been through are designed to keep you out of there. Mm -hmm. You don't have collateral. You don't have a house that's worth three times. You don't have steady work history. You live in the wrong zip code. There is nothing about the traditional system that is there to support. So we need to have our own credit box. So at Potlicker, we don't look at credit reports. We don't even look at tax returns. I drive around in an RV. I was talking somebody here told me to stop because <laughs> I'm getting too old. I'm on an RV trip now. I just stopped off to talk to you all. But, um, <laughs> but I'm out in the cotton fields. You want to hear some heartbreak to see two generations, the father and the sons and the daughters, and that father is scared to death. They cannot get a loan in their neighborhood. They cannot move the land. They used to make loans in, here in Boston. You know, you build a store here and the environment's hostile, you can move to the other side, you know, move to. You can't move your family's land that you got a generation ago. They are stuck on islands where they can't get an equipment loan, a line of credit for a crop loan, they can't get insurance. That's why we're losing land. Mm -hmm. We are not going to solve this. I know this might be controversial. We are not going to solve land protection by one-off white philanthropy donating five acres here and there. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, there are five million acres of black land still owned, if the numbers are right, from the 12, 2017 census, owned by black farmers who are black principals. 80% of that land is row crop and livestock. We can talk about growing fruit and food and all this stuff. That's not where our people are, you all. I'm not saying we, we need to do that. We do need to do that. But we need to create intermediaries that foster conversion. They can't. If you can barely live farming the conventional way, how are you going to forego the loss of revenues as you transition and improve the soil? Who pays for that? They can't get a government grant. So I'm giving you examples, but this is... This is heavy. It is not going to change by knocking on the door of the USDA. Mm -hmm. The banks are not lending them money. They hide their assets. They split their land among the family members so that the community, because they all talk to each other. Remember, they've been there. Their grandfathers know each other. The kids, they've been discriminating. For, this is, and this is the rural wherever. It's not just the South. I was in New Jersey. It's rural wherever. And, and so you're in a system that is designed to either hold you down or eliminate you. So I'm saying to all of you in this room, um, if you have time and the means, it's about creating new institutions. Khan and I decided at our age, we, we were not doing a program. So we sell notes to the community. You can be a credit, non a credit. Uh, Potlicker is national. We're in like 15 states. We talk to farmers. We don't have equipment. We created a national equipment trust. You know, we're coming up with ideas. So I'm just, I'm encouraging, use our creativity. In Africa, they share equipment. Why are we not doing this here? Mm -hmm. You know, why are we not working as a community? You all have the tools that I did not. I never heard of impact investing until I was, you know, close to 40 or so. I think about what I could have done had I known about it. But I think you need to stop using that word. We call it reparative capital, double entendre, mm -hmm. reparations and, and repair. We are repairing communities. I'm not out there trying to give a farm loan. When we give out resources, we look for five, and you have to be willing to pass it on. You could be the best loan possible. If you can't play with your neighbors, we will not give you a loan. It's about 10, 15. So what can you do with collectivism? Market aggregation deal. Now you got enough volume to sell to the local school system. Now you can share equipment. Now you can hire and bring in new people to apprentice. Like, think about That's the way we think. That's what my father showed me when I went to Zimbabwe. So I'm encouraging you. This is a long one to answer. Yeah. I was ready for both of you. Yes, yeah, just... <laughs> There is an opportunity to take what you know in your heart and what your grandmother and grandfather told you 
and put that in finance, put that at the center, and then you back into what the price of the money is. You back into, is it a 10-year loan? We don't know what the loan is when I talk to somebody. We said that we go through four months, four months to understand the business model. And we make the capital fit what they need to have happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let me, let me ask Derek, because that was, how have you seen strategies where people are able to back into it? Because not all fund, uh, you know, loan funds or not all of these different programs and, and initiatives have that type of flexibility. So if you could just share a little bit about how you've seen some creativity, how you've done it at your organization, mm -hmm. um, but what's actually working now, and then we'll get into what we should be creating for the future. Yeah. Um, can you hear Derek without the mic? Can you all hear me without the mic? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think Mark's right that we need our own intermediaries. I think that is really key. Um, I have made a comment about control of land, and I think that's really important. And the fact that all these churches are closing predominantly in, in marginalized communities is an opportunity to take control of that land. But where I've seen it working kind of what we're doing now is we've created a new financial vehicle that is called a Diversified Community Investment Fund. It's called a DCIF. And how that's different from your normal um, debt and equity community funds is that a diversified community investment fund is um, created to primarily invest in land. And so as long as you have, I think it's like a 60-40, if you have 60% of your um, capital invested in real estate, then that bypasses the 1940, or the Investment Act of 1940. And so you're able to invest the other 40% in businesses or whatever you want to invest in. But the real um, benefit to that is a diversified community investment fund allows for all of us to invest in our community. Think about, you know, most of us, you know, are probably putting money into some type of retirement plan that we don't know where it's invested. <laughs> I don't know how many of you all look at your 401ks and where those dollars are invested, but you have the option to do a self-directed retirement account to where you can self-direct your dollars into a, a place where you want to see it grow or where you want to see it have an impact on your own community. And I think that's one of the vehicles that we're using to invest in each other because generally these type of funds and these type of investments are reserved for accredited investors. And the only thing you have to be to be accredited is to have some type of, you know, senior level financial experience or you have to be wealthy. I mean, that's essentially it. But a DCIF allows any one of us to put as low as $100 into a fund that's investing and in taking back control of land in our community. And there's several different options that we can use to um, redirect our dollars that way. And so the fact that um, although the legislation is poor when it comes to opportunity zones, but people who are wealthy and people who do have a conscience, i.e. churches, I'm telling you, that's a lot of capitals there. Um, these churches can invest in these type of funds that um, where they, if it's in an opportunity zone, they can receive the tax breaks. That legislation is poor, it needs to be redone, but it's something that's there that we can be taking advantage of now. And we can be putting processes together to advocate to make sure that the legislation is better. Because right now it's just a tax haven for rich people. But the fact that it allows all of us to invest in our community, I think is, is the real kicker. And that's called a, a diversified community investment fund that 
we're organizing right now in Cincinnati. And then, Mark, I don't know if you know, but your pot liquor is a part of a... <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> a collaboration <laughs> with, uh, with RSF Finance yeah. where we're actively looking at play, finding these intermediaries, these BIPOC intermediaries, and then directing cash right to them. I wanted to transition us to thinking about community investing versus individual investing uh, or, or investing into a particular business because, again, in our opening session, we talked a lot about how it's natural for us as black people to support one another, right? Many of us grew up in this culture of community support. You leaned on someone, you, you take two steps, you pull in someone with you. Um, we're in a, a current space of, you know, every person for themselves at this point. This very solopreneur, um, I don't know, do you culture, whatever you want to call it, um, that is in confliction with what we, what we know and what's in our DNA. So I wanted to talk about the advantages of community investment strategies versus individual and is it, is versus the business one. And is there a pro or con for a particular direction. I I um. I'd argue, let's just talk about community organization or activism, mm -hmm. and I say that because. There, so the the number one reason why black businesses fail, the ones that actually get started, is because of lack of working capital. Mm -hmm. I'll get to the point. Mm -hmm. but uh, um, So the SBA itself presented a report um, that showed that the white business entrepreneur and the black business entrepreneur, the returns are the same. The sales growth is the same off one, if you can get in business, right? What happens is that years three through whenever, when you're still not bankable and the bank won't touch you and you don't have collateral, which I will come back to, the black business owner goes out. You growth costs money, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. so the black business still can't get to the bank if they don't have a Ujima in their town. You're sitting in, you know, wherever, including Chicago. Mm -hmm. Where do you go? The CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, <laughs> is yet another arm. I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying they are in that credit box or they're taking treasury money. Mm -hmm. So. So where does that person go? So all these dreams, our possibilities, crash year three. And then you got terrible credit. You can't even get back into the old system. So I say when we talk about community activism, what does it look like to have a collateral pool, a guaranteed pool? I created one of these at another. I worked at Fair Food Fund. Um, it was on that investment committee. But during the middle of the pandemic, um, we were thinking, how do we keep these businesses? A lot of our businesses are food businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, we're selling our culture. How do you keep these businesses that still are in that valley, years, you know, three through whenever? Because they can't get a bank loan. If they don't get a PPP loan, which we didn't get our share, how do they stay in business? So I thought, well, I remember from 2000, a little older, I remember from uh, the 90s, I remember from Black Monday, I remember from, <laughs> from 2008, liquidity. Mm -hmm. Liquidity means that money, like you said, was circulating. Mm -hmm. People need assets. They need guarantees. If they have a guarantee, the bank will give them a loan. Their grandfather or grandmother will give them a loan. So we quickly, we made it up. Talk about Black possibility, made it up in a weekend. And came up with, I'm just giving you guys, like, I'm trying to have everybody walk out here with some ideas, <laughs> not just to listen to me. Made it up to solve a problem. Pull that money. We took some, actually, Boston-based people. Called them up, and I said, would you see this? It's going to be two-thirds grant money and one-third recoverable grant money. Recoverable grants are like loans, but mm -hmm. if you don't have the money, you don't have to pay them back. All right. And I said, have, it have TA embedded in it? And emergency crisis, like their balance sheet might be messed up. Maybe they need a bankruptcy attorney, whatever. And we would assign this to businesses, not in our portfolio, but to other. Mm -hmm. What does that? 
That's how you mm-hmm. keep the money flowing in that mm-hmm. neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Call up that bank at the CDFI and say, look, we will back these businesses. Now, church, so that's an idea. That's something that we did and, and over weekend and it became a million and a half. I'm going to do it, in for, do it again for the farmers. So that's an idea, working capital lines, maybe the church. What I do, um, charitable loan funds, is actually the contract is out of a group of um, regulations that came from the church, mm-hmm. church extension laws, which allowed entities to raise money from the community, non-accredited and accredited, for a charitable purpose. That's why we're a church. So that we could raise, if somebody was living in Alabama and wanted to invest in the farmers, that they, there's no way for them to do it. But they came with us at Potlicker. So there are all these sorts of things, that, but you need to mix in like a, a rubric. So mi- mixing the things from the old world and stuff from our community, and then you come up with these vehicles that are compliant. And that's how we solve our own specific issues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, before we go to questions, yep. I'm going to ask you, Derek, to talk about not just the churches. I want you to bring in the, the faith-based experience, too, but what other institutions might need to take a step in in order to have some real impact, and who needs to take a step back? That's a good one. I, I would say that um, hospitals... Are really you and big. Hospital Mecca right here in Boston. Hospitals too. are a really big uh, deal when it comes to economic development and when it comes to we, as we talk about community investing and community development, it's uh, important to understand these two things. Community development is about building quality of life. So it's about making sure that your hospitals, your your schools. Um, your doctor's office, all of those are running smoothly, making sure that you have green space and parks where kids can play and grow. Community development is about building quality of life. Economic development is about building wealth and creating jobs. And community development practitioners and economic development practitioners do not work together, and for whatever reason, I don't know why. And so I've been spending the past 10 years really just trying to get these two practices working together for the purposes of, 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 of building our own community and building that community from the inside out. And so schools, I mean, back when I was growing up in the late 70s, 80s, <laughs> I mean, you know, there was a thing called vocational school where when that school building might have closed at three o'clock, but it opened back up at five or six because there was evening programming for adults that was happening at that school. And so think about the assets that are already in your community that could be leveraged for economic development. And that's why I keep talking about land and churches closing down and leaving that vacuum of land that's gonna be bought up by private equity and so it would, be, it would behoove us to pull our capital together. And this could be done in the form of a cooperative. I mean, you know, we, we, we have worker cooperatives, we have food cooperatives. Um, what we don't talk about are financial cooperatives because they do exist. And I think that, you know, when you look at it from an asset-based community development aspect, it's looking at what's already in your community that's not being used because oftentimes there's assets and there's in a community that are often overlooked. And, and um, but again, churches, schools, hospitals, these are the big economic developers that cross over into quality of life. I wanna thank you both so much for your responses and kick it to the audience to see if we can um, take, I think we have maybe six or seven minutes to do some Q&A. When I give you the mic, I'd also like you to share with us how you would redefine impact investing. Just a word. Just a word. You don't need to go on a spin. 
when we first um, talked about this panel, um, both of you were like, oh, I don't like that word. We need to switch it up. It's, it's not fitting to what it is that this work is really about. So uh, introduce yourself and tell us how you would redefine it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Smith. Um, I'm at the Zerdna Foundation in New York. This has been a really inspiring conversation. This whole morning has been amazing. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but I'm also energized by the possibility. Um, I'm just going to echo our friend here and say reparative capital. That was like a, a light bulb moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is really about um, what are the different kind of opportunities and challenges between like the rural, suburban, urban? And could you just dig in a little bit about the differences? So I hear that, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around farming today and about land-based practices. I live in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn. Hmm. It's a different economy, right? So let's just, thank you. I, you're amazing, by the way. <laughs> the, the hype man is really here. Um, so yeah, I would just love to hear about kind of urban, rural, suburban. Thank you for um, the humor. Um, so we were talking about our own roots the we, we don't like to naturally subdivide. So um, I have some agrarian parents, I call them. They live outside Chicago. And they were black activists in the city, then moved out to uh, about an hour south. It's the largest land uh, of black-owned agrarian land north of the Mason-Dixon line. Totally not in production for the reasons we know. And one of the words that I learned recently is peri-urban, which was to look at the interconnections of where people are, food sheds, it's urban, and it's uh, uh, agrarian or, or rural. And that to think about the networks of the way goods are transported back and forth and the opportunity. There's transportation businesses back and forth, distribution businesses back and forth, Production, I mean, think about that. Why are we allowing ourselves to be ghetto ties and only want this, all this nation is ours? Mm. So, mm. why are we not thinking about regional networks? So I'm big into system stuff now. Mm. So, regional networks of, we have some folks in Chicago, she, she is like knocking the lights out on prenatal food. She wants to source from black farmers. There are no big black distributors. There's a nonprofit one, but they're not all over the country. We're trying to figure out how do we get her to source from Mississippi, which is 10 hours away, because I've been driving it, 10 hours away from Chicago. I just I want people to think about what does it look like to look all around Atlanta, all around Oakland, all around Chicago. All, I just came from New York. All of New York, the young farmers used to live in Brooklyn and the Bronx. And now they're selling their goods back and forth. Black Maple Syrup Company. Trees are in upstate New York. The syrup is sold in Brooklyn. Somebody's got to package it, market it, produce it. It's a, that's a whole industry for mm -hmm. us, especially given our roots. So I just, I think this, I want to encourage people to think about, and I will stop. Think about the problem you're trying to solve first, and then think about how to finance it. If it's health or, econ or well-being, what do you need to do? And then think about the money. What kind of money do you need to do that? Not the other way around. Mm. I'm going to um, mm -hmm. have Justin ask a question. <laughs> All right. I want to try to get two more. So. Yeah, mine's a quick question. It's more of a, a yes or no, because I lots of questions for follow-up. For, for, for follow My word would be a salutogenic investment fund. And we're recently doing a lot of work around health and, and wellness, hospital systems. Um, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. Pathogenic would be right where you talk about disease, uh, but salutogenic will be talking about the sourcing to like what causes the stress and, and the reparative uh, funds. My question, very quick, um, you talked about the diver... Diversified Community Investment Fund. DCIF. Yeah, yeah is, a, is a community investment trust, is that something that fits under that umbrella? Is that? Well, it operates like a real estate investment trust, so like a REIT. 
And then um, you can also um, do land trust under that as well. Is that, but does that come under DCIF? DCIF could be the umbrella for all of that, yes. Thanks. All right. I'm Vidal Hill from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm an artist, professor, uh, <laughs> developer, and I run a nonprofit for youth. And we, we're looking back quite a bit today ancestrally. I'm constantly looking side to side and down at the youth. Everything we're starting is going to have to be worked by the next generation. Mm -hmm. So often we're not communicating how. We tell a lot of why and what, but not how. We, in our families, we usually hide the marks and scars, especially publicly, but they don't get to see the reality. So one of the things I thought of when developing was we just need someone to sign, someone to guarantee it. I don't want anything free. I have a great idea. It will yield income. I just can't guarantee it because of that credit box. Is there a way to formulate, I'm on my way into my senior years. I have built this all up. How can I simply sign for that credit line? Not just a one-time gift. 50 <laughs> Thousands great as a grant. That often happens. What about a $50,000 credit line that they can use constantly and that'll save most small businesses? How does that look, I guess, formulated legally? Yeah. I mean, the quick, quick answer of, uh, can I just talk? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the quick answer is I think if you frame the need, there are folks in our community, even it's important that people in our community step in, not just outside. When I have started a business before, I was able to raise a half million dollars from black people. So I think, but part of it is the framing of the opportunity. It's not oh my God, we're gonna go out of business, blah, 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 we don't have this money. It's, look at all the impact this is having. No, I don't like impact investors, but look at all the, the influences, the opportunities that are being created. Most people who have a couple coins or whatever, and a one-year credit line, you pay that back in a year, and then you roll it out again. Most people would do that. Most people would give you $50,000, you pay it back, and they may call their friends. You could create your own little club that, that just financed that particular situation. But don't frame it as a, as a savior thing. Frame it as an investment in the community. Well, that's, that's what that, I would do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the, it's time to wrap it up, but I'm going to, I know I saw your hand. You want to ask her? It's time. I need the microphone so this yeah. recording. Yeah. And I'll be very quick. Hi, Dorian Nunez. I'm a uh, native of New York City, uh, the great do or die bed star, and so I'm delighted to be up here. But now, thank you. <laughs> thank you. District of Shirley Chisholm, unbossed and unbought, the great Shirley Chisholm. Um, but, my but now I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I've lived, I know Derek people, I've lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. A lot of difference, like your exposure to Chicago. If you want to find black farmers, come on down to where I am in New Orleans, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, and Tennessee, because that's where black people, black land, and where segregation and challenges still exist. Mm -hmm. So we need your Chicago infrastructure and mentality and the possibilities to come down to places where it is harder. I'm just going to tell you, it ain't impossible, but it's harder to get stuff done down in the deep, deep, deep south. Mm. So we, I have funds now that have raised money but can't find matching capital. Businesses that are thriving and are unable to find what they need. And yet there's 10, and I'm, I'm gonna stop. I said I would be brief. I'm doing a session tomorrow at 11 o'clock with Sheena Anthony, show me the money. And we put a meetup in your Hoover app so that we could get those who have money together so that they can then talk to people who need money. The solution that you want 
It's right here. It's today. And if you don't walk out of here tomorrow with an answer and a solution, it's because we did not come together collectively. And we did not practice Ujima. And mm. so it, it's more than a title. It's a process. It's a value. There's $50,000 sitting in, outside having coffee right now. That'll guarantee your loan. And if that doesn't work, there's $10 billion from the Treasury that's set aside in something called the State Small Business yes. Credit Initiative. SSCCI. That's, that's supposed to give you money. What state are you in, young man? Milwaukee, Come on. I know. I could get you. I know folks in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I know folks in Madison, Wisconsin. The state of Wisconsin has a program. They just they may not have it in time for what you need, but it exists today for what you need tomorrow. That's supposed to be a loan guarantee program. And then black philanthropists will fill in that gap. Potluck will fill in the gap if you have a solid plan. Anyway, I didn't mean to, I, I'm going to wrap this up for you, but my point is I would be committing the sin of omission if I did not make the statement that the solution is in this room. That's right. Yeah. The solution is in this room. So everybody who got money, sit over here. Everybody who need money, sit over there. And then after we network collectively and collectively, so, yeah. we come together. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? And a certain foundation from bed will fund the grant that we need for the working capital to make it all happen. The right relationships is key. There are, there are all types of things out there that you can do, yeah. Thank you. I couldn't think of a better way to wrap up the session. The money's here, the ideas are here, the creativity's here. We just gotta make those connections and build it. So thank you all for coming to this session. Uh, make sure that you're connecting with someone who you didn't know before coming in here. And thank you, Derek and Mark, for sharing the stage. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. So...